Coming up, what's this business at the Olympics of biological males with XY chromosomes seemingly pummeling biological women? Uh, I want to discuss this issue and uh, point out some complications involving it. And uh, Roger Kimball, uh, editor, writer, author, a very smart guy, brainiac, is going to join me. We're going to talk about Kamala Harris. Uh, hey, if you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google, or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. <laughs> needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. I want to talk in my opening segment about this um, big controversy all over social media in the Olympics involving boxers who are biologically male, XY chromosome, fighting against biological women and clobbering them, just um, pummeling them, reducing them to tears, humiliating them. And this would appear to be a certain form of, well, let's call it the, it's the Olympic equivalent of like domestic abuse. I don't even know what else to call it. And so you have two of the semifinalists in the Olympic boxing women's section who are actually biologically male or seem to be biologically male. We're going to dive into this a little bit more. Now, when you look at the videos, and there was a video, the first video that came out involved the Italian woman, Angela Carini, who just quits after about 40 seconds uh, in, in her fight against this guy named Khalif. And, uh, and then she just starts basically not quite bawling, but almost. And then she doesn't shake his hand. And in the second episode, I didn't realize there was a second kind of male boxer in the ring in the women's section. And uh, this appears to be a, um, uh, let's see, this guy, uh, the second guy is, um, um, he just had a fight and he pummeled a woman so badly. This is a female boxer, Svetlana Staneva. The, guys, uh, the, the guy that uh, beat her up is called Lin Yu Ting. And at the end of the fight, what she does is she defiantly makes the X sign. She does this. And guess what it means? She means, I have X, X chromosomes. So she's making a point. And, uh, and it's a legitimate point. Now, interestingly, the head of the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, uh, who appears to be this French guy, he, he does a press conference and he goes, well, these people are trying to own what it means to be a woman. He goes, we don't want to be part of some kind of a culture war. Um, these are not trans at all. He goes, these boxers are women. He says they were born as women. He goes, their passports say they are women. They've lived as women. And so they are women. Now, there, there's a lot to say about this. First of all, with regard to the culture war, I want to make the point that it's kind of surprising to have someone from the Olympics say, we don't want to be part of any culture war. Rem remember the opening ceremony? Have we forgotten about the parody of The Last Supper? Have we forgotten about all the bacchanalia, the kind of... Um, uh, the um, uh, perverse exhibition that was put on as a mockery of traditional values and of Christianity. If you don't want to be part of a culture war, why would you do that? Why would you do that and shove it in the face of everybody who's there just to watch sports? That's point number one. Now, I think point number two is something that's very interesting, which is that the head of the IOC is trying to get out of the issue of whether or not trans women are really women. Because, I mean, that's the slogan of the LGBTQ community. That's the slogan of the left. Trans women are women. And so this guy could have gone that, down that road. He could have said, well, uh, these two boxers, uh, the uh, Khalif and uh, Yu Ting, are women. They might look like men, they might walk like men, but if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and looks like a duck and waddles like a duck, it's not a duck. It's, in fact, something else. It's a crow. 
Uh, why? Because it identifies as a crow. So he could have gone that way, but it's interesting that he's not doing that. What he's really doing, in a sense, is admitting that trans women are not women. He's admitting that if these boxers were, in fact, biological males who were trans, they should not be fighting against women. But what he's saying is that they are not that. He's saying, in effect, and he's, in a sense, speaking for the two boxers, he's saying, I'm not trans. I'm not trans. That is their, that is their defense. Now, how is it possible for these two characters in the ring to be male in every outward way, male in terms of their superior strength, male evidently in terms of their chromosomes, and still, quote, women. Well, it turns out that it, it appears in at least one case, and maybe both, that you, we might be dealing with a very rare sort of, um, a rare condition. And this is explained in an interesting post by a medical doctor on, on X, on Twitter. And this is what he says. He says that basically it's testosterone that determines whether or not you go in the XX direction or the XY direction. He goes, when, you're, when you're, you have the first few weeks of life in the womb, the external genitalia are undifferentiated. They're neither male nor female. But the presence of androgen or testosterone essentially develops those characteristics in the womb. But, he says, and this is the part I found fascinating, he says, in some cases, a condition called uh, a condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome occurs in which androgens, which is testosterone, is produced, but it cannot act effectively because of non-functional receptors. So your body has the testosterone, but it doesn't manifest itself into male sex organs. So here's the interesting thing, is he says, in these cases, although the embryo has XY chromosomes and is genetically male, the external genitalia develop is typically female. That appears to be the case with this fellow Khalif. And that, I think, is what the IOC chairman or president was alluding to when he says this guy was born a woman. Now, the International Boxing Federation, interestingly, which has clashed with the IOC, has come out and made the statement, and I think this is very interesting, they made the statement that the IOC is not, in fact, using proper medical criteria here. They're using kind of observational criteria. Hey, have you, have you lived as a woman? And then they're also using the sort of passport criteria. Let's look at your passport. Let's see what it says. Now, the truth of it is, when you file for a passport, they're basically going to put on your passport whatever you say. They're not going to say, you can get a passport, particularly if you're allowed to migrate from country to country. Hey, listen, I want to have a passport. I want to change my name to this. I want to, you know, list me as female. And here's a picture of me with long hair. Do I look female? So what I'm getting at is, is the International Boxing Federation guys are saying that the IOC is using very sloppy unscientific criteria to decide who gets to be uh, a woman. Now, the other thing I find interesting is that you've got these very conservative countries like Algeria. This guy, Khalif, this comes from Algeria. And as I understand it, homosexuality is restricted in Nigeria. And being trans, I mean, forget it. Uh, so why would the Algerians, you might ask, be kind of okay with this? Aren't they saying this is a disgrace to the country? I think the answer to that is that the Algerians are like, well, I mean, I, this is only my speculation. They're desperate to win an Olympic medal. It's really hard for a country like Algeria to win a medal. They can go the entire Olympics, no medals. And so I think what the, what what's going on is that they're like, you know, this is crazy this guy is, you know, this guy is this, he's got this intermediate peculiar condition. But guess what? If we can put Muhammad in the ring, although Muhammad now calls himself Iman or whatever, you know, a female name, and Muhammad can pulverize all the women in the ring and we come out with a medal, that's a price that we're willing to pay. So Algeria gets a gold or a silver out of it. This is the only explanation I can think of for why a country like Algeria would be okay with this kind of nonsense. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the increasing cost of health insurance? Have you had enough of not having control over your healthcare dollars? 
introducing ShareRight. It's healthcare done the right way. At ShareRight, you're not just a number. You're part of a caring community. And forget about paying excessive premiums with ShareRight. You stand to save 30 to 50% compared to health insurance. So think about what you could do with all those savings. But it's more than just savings. ShareRight ensures that you have access to the care you deserve precisely when you need it, from routine checkups to unexpected emergencies. With ShareRight, your healthcare is their top priority. So empower yourself today by taking control of your healthcare costs. Visit ShareRight, S-H-A-R-E-R-I-G-H-T, ShareRight.org slash Dinesh to learn more, see how much you can save. Visit ShareRight.org slash Dinesh. That's ShareRight.org slash Dinesh for healthcare done the right way. You asked and MyPillow listened. They're finally bringing you the most requested offer ever. Right now, you can get the queen-size premium MyPillow for just $19.98. Wow. MyPillow is made with patented adjustable fill. It adjusts to your exact individual needs regardless of your sleep position. It helps keep your neck aligned and holds its shape all night so you can get the best sleep of your life. That's not all. Get their six-piece kitchen or bath towel sets for just $25. The brand new mattress topper as low as $69.98 and their famous MyPillow bed sheets for as low as $25. So much more. Um, go to MyPillow.com or you can call 800-876-0227. The number again, 800-876-0227. When you use promo code Dinesh, you get big discounts on all the MyPillow products, including the premium queen size MyPillow, just $19.98. That's the lowest price ever. Don't delay. Order today. Go to MyPillow.com, but make sure to use the promo code. It's D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. Guys, I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast um, one of the real sort of conservative intellectuals of the past uh, two or three decades or, or more. It's Roger Kimball. And I first came across Roger with his book. This goes back, I think, to the 1990s. Uh, Roger can correct me if I'm wrong, Tenured Radicals. But since then, he has uh, published a great deal. He's currently the editor and publisher of the new Criterion. Most recently, he edited and contributed to Where Next? Western Civilization at the Crossroads and also contributed to Against the Great Reset, 18 Theses Contra the New World Order. You can follow him on X at Roger Kimball, two L's at Roger Kimball. The website is newcriterion.com. Roger, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Um, I, I do great to be with you, Dinesh. I believe it's the first time I'm having you on the podcast, which kind of embarrasses me because you should be uh, a regular. You have you uh -huh. write so much. You have so much to say. I want to talk to you about your most recent article in American Greatness. It's called Kamala Harris and the Mask of Magical Thinking. Yes. Uh, but, yes. but before we get there, let me ask you a question that I think you would be... Um, you, like me, have come out of the uh, the neoconservative and the conservative yes. world of the Reagan years. Uh, yes. We were pretty close over these years to guys like Bill Kristol, uh, guys like, um, uh, gosh, I'm just, uh, I'm running out of names here, but you know all the names. These are the guys who hung out at AEI and hung out at, yes. uh, were part of the Hoover Institution. They published in commentary, well, John Podhoritz. Uh, is yes. another example. Um, and my question is this, There's, there was a sharp pivot in which a number of these conservative intellectuals turned first against Trump, and they began to call yes. themselves never Trumpers. And yes. many of us thought, okay, well, they're not for Trump, but they're still conservative. They're still Republicans. They're not going to throw their lot in with the Democrats. Uh, and some of them have stopped short of that. Uh, and they'll say things now like, well, I'm not I'm not going to vote for Trump, but I can't bring myself to vote for Biden. But there are others who have gone all the way and thrown their lot yes. in with with Biden Indeed. and the Democrats. So yeah. I'd like you to just comment, just reflect a little bit on, on what do you think has happened with this group? Well, you know, I wish I wish I had the answer to that. Um, Dinesh, I can I can speculate. I've I've given it a fair amount of thought actually because I find it a puzzling phenomenon. I don't find it puzzling that people would have reacted negatively to Donald Trump when he first came on the scene. Uh, I did. Uh, I did know, too. I, I I probably wrote you know a score of articles making fun of him. But to me, uh, and 
life never or very rarely presents you with a clear uh, alternative between something that is an unalloyed good and something that is bad. And so it was in this case, I, I had been supporting Ted Cruz, a, a politician I continue to admire. But Ted Cruz's uh, candidacy in 2016 uh, ended, it imploded. And so the choice, the real choice, the only choice that faced anybody who was uh, serious about these things was Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And so just right there, uh, uh, I, I would vote for the terrier who lives across the street from me before I would vote for Hillary Clinton. At the time, she held the title for the most corrupt, serious politician running for president in the history of the republic. Probably. I, maybe you know somebody who was more corrupt. Uh, I, I don't. But I think that Joe Biden has given her a serious run for her money uh, on, on that title. But uh, that was the choice, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. And then I began listening to Donald Trump, and he was, said a lot of things that I liked. I liked what he said about the border. I think it's a good a, a thing to have a border if you're a country. He, I liked what he said about the inner city. I mean, every inner city that is a disaster now, and it's many, many of them, have been run by Democrats for decades. And it's a total disaster area. I liked what he said about energy. I think that um, what the world needs now to uh, quote Robert Bryce, the energy specialist, is cheap, abundant energy, period, full stop, end of sentence and end of end of discussion, really. And Donald Trump was uh, was advocating that. What he said about our alliances, I thought that was very important. Why should the United States pay for NATO? Uh, what, what he said about the Middle East, um, I like I like that. And uh, what he said about regulation, I like that. And so more and more as the campaign went on, I find myself I found myself as being part of his cheerleading party. And then he became president, and lo and behold. He actually did what he said he was going to do. In my view, he had one of the most successful terms as president of anybody in history. He was the only major thing he was unable to accomplish was getting rid of Obamacare. And that was because uh, of John McCain in his last uh, uh, act of petulance before shuffling off his mortar, mortar coil uh, uh, killed Killed the, killed the vote. So, um, no, he, I thought he had, was incredibly successful. And he's also tumultuous. So there's no doubt about that. Um, I think he's learned a lot. I think uh, if he is reelected president this year, which I, I am confident that he will be, uh, it, his second administration will be even better. Um, but you, you began by asking about the, the never Trump phenomenon. Uh, yeah, Roger, to... Roger, if I can jump in here, I, yeah. what you've said is, you know, to me, deepens the conundrum, right? Because, yes. because it, it raises the question, even if these guys had reasonable anxieties about Trump, they yes. began to believe that he might be a bull in the China shop, you know, yes. destroy our alliances, uh, yes. pr precipitate war, wreck the economy. Uh, it right. would all be about himself. He'd be preening and just taking photos of himself all day, kind of Louis the yes. 14th or Louis the 16th style. Right. And Trump did none of that. And if yes. anything, he sort of made the art of governance look almost easy. He showed that, you know, yes. I'm an amateur. I can come in and do a pretty good yes. job. So you right. would think that some of these guys would be like, uh-huh, all right, well, we misjudged him a little. Let's sort of swing back. But no, they they dug they in even down. more. Why yeah. is that? Well, well, you know, I remember uh, talking to a friend of mine. I think you, you know him too, uh, Jim Pearson. We were talking about the phenomenon of Bill Crystal. Jim knows him very well. And, uh, you know, earlier on, it, it, Jim said, well, I wonder what what would what would Bill say? Does he what does he dislike about Trump? Is it is it his support for the military? You know, he's spending a trillion dollars building up the military or is it his support for Israel? Does he dislike that? You know, no, of course, he must like both those things, but he can't quite bring himself to say that. Or you remember uh, Brett Stevens, a uh, uh, friend of mine, sort of, and he uh, I wrote a piece in the New York Times after Trump had been in office, I think for a year or two. And he listed all of the things that conservatives should like about Trump. And he said, I like these two, but I still don't like him because he's a man of bad character. Well, 
I'm not, I, you know, Jonah Goldberg made the same argument. In fact, I had a long exchange with Jonah about this. My view is that we are not, when you're voting for president, you're not voting um, in the College of Cardinals for Pope or, or uh, beatifying somebody. It's not a matter of sainthood. It's you want somebody, somebody who can uh, do the job. Even Cardinal Newman understood this. He said, people's, you know, some people might be great at uh, running a government, but, but you, know, uh, you know, not so great in their personal life or whatever. What I care about is Donald Trump's ability as a leader. And, it, and that, he's, I think he's shown himself to be brilliant. I used to think that the objection to Trump was primarily aesthetic, that Trump wasn't one of us for, for somebody like Bill Kristol. But I think it goes much deeper than that. In fact, it, and it's less... Uh, commendatory for the for the people who hate Trump. I think it's that he's not one of them in a much deeper sense. He's not part of the globalist elite. He would be uncomfortable at Davos. He is not interested in the Great Reset. He wants to reset the Great Reset, which I do as well. He he. I think that the people who are most profoundly anti-Trump have, to some very large extent signed on to the swamp, to this, uh, to this cathedral, to use uh, the term that I think was Curtis Yarvin coined, uh, that contains the, the people who actually run the government, who have this consensus about uh, uh, what we should do. And the rest of us are just there sort of to be pawns in their game. And uh, the, the people who are profoundly anti-Trump are right about one thing. And that is that he represents an existential threat to their, uh, to their own thriving. If Trump is reelected, he is going to profoundly disrupt that globalist, elitist, deep state, woke consensus. Uh, in my view, that's a good thing. That makes me uh, love him all the more. But for them, they understand that the party will come to an abrupt stop if he's reelected. We'll be right back with Roger Kimball. Guys, it's a big election year, and if you'd like to support my work, I'd like to invite you to become a subscriber to my Locals channel. By the way, a big movie also coming out this fall. I post a lot of exclusive content on Locals, including content that's censored on other social media platforms. On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic is off limits. I've uploaded some cool films to Locals, documentaries and feature films films, my films, but also films by others. 2000 Mules is up there. Uh, the film that came out last fall, Police State, and the new film coming out in September. You're not going to want to miss it. Hey, if you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch this movie content for free. It's included with your subscription. So check out the channel. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'm back with uh, Roger Kimball, the website newcriterion.com. Follow him on X at Roger Kimball, K-I-M-B-A-L-L. He's editor and publisher of the New Criterion, a very urbane and erudite cultural and political uh, magazine. Uh, Roger, um, we were talking about the Never Trumpers. And yes. let me offer this thought because I, I think you're onto something just really very powerful here. And that is that... As you say, initially, uh, there was a certain sense in which these guys were on a different wavelength as Trump. You know, Reagan understood the importance of the intellectuals. Reagan sort of paid a homage to Buckley and um, yes. you know Hayek, and 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 Trump doesn't do that. So in that sense, he's outside the world of the intellectual class. That's true, and yes. you made that point yourself. But I think the second thing is, and, and this is something I didn't, I underestimated, the deep hubris of the intellectual class. It's yes. almost as if having misjudged Trump, mm -hmm. they couldn't bring themselves to say, you know what, we dug in, we were incredibly arrogant about it, and we were wrong. Uh, and so as a result, they had to kind of dig deeper and show why they were correct after all. And, and this has forced them to ultimately, uh, in a sense, embrace the critique of the left. But the third point you made, which I think is the strongest of them all, 
is the fact that there is in fact a rather comfortable and deep swamp and somehow the think tanks and the think tank class I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't see it when I was there myself, but there was a little part of me that was aware that, you know what, like, where does AEI get its money? It gets mm-hmm. its money from a handful of corporations and some wealthy individuals. And, you know, once a year, we all go to Breckenridge or Beaver Creek and we <laughs> hang out with these guys and Kissinger is yeah. there. And, you know, we do a dog yeah. and pony show. But right. but. I wasn't quite aware the degree to which we are dependent on all that. In fact, we are yes. mendicants in that world. Yes. And if those yes. guys, so those guys do control you. Uh, yes. And that's kind of, I think, what you're saying, that they're, yes. that they're worried that Trump will bring this gravy train somehow to an end. At an abrupt end. And I, I hope he does. You know, the people in the, what I call the lanyard class, uh, they, <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they're they're poised to lose the most, I think. Uh, I mean, it's a complicated phenomenon, the, the reaction about Trump. I mean, he is a strange uh, creature, and he's he's really is from outside the political dispensation that has been running the country. But in my view, that political dispensation is a horrible drag on the future prosperity and security of the United States. I think that they, they have become almost, it sounds melodramatic to say, but I think they have become, uh, well, certainly counterproductive, maybe even the enemy of prosperity and security. And one way of judging that is to look at the way in which they deploy demo- the word democracy, especially in the phrase, which I find slightly nauseating, our democracy. Remember, January 6th was supposed to be an attack on our democracy. Donald Trump's very existence is an attack on our democracy. But what can that possibly mean? The more we know about January 6th, just I don't want to get into that too much, but the more we understand, I believe, that uh, it was at least in part fomented by the establishment. Why were all those um, undercover agents dressed up as Trump supporters inside the Capitol before anything started? Why did the Capitol Police welcome the protesters with open arms at first? And it goes, there's a very long list of things uh, that one can say about that. And remember, Donald Trump urged his followers to go to the Capitol. This is a quote to show their displeasure peacefully and patriotically. That is completely, you know, forgotten in the vendetta that Liz Cheney and others conducted, the witch trial, the the Stalinist uh, star chamber trial that they conducted against Trump. But le- let's leave, leave that to one side. You know, it's um, the, the, the truth of the matter is that if you ask yourself, what was Donald Trump's originary tort? What was the thing that he did? that really put him beyond the pale. Why, he was elected in a free, open, and democratic election. We were told that that was impossible. And uh, rather than acknowledging it, you remember after, after he was elected, the left went nuts. All of those females on the mall in their pink hats, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the, the, the people screaming that this was illegitimate. The, uh, I think Bill Crystal actually had a hand in um, uh, convincing these B-list celebrities to go on, make an ad and, and beg electors to, uh, you know, not do their duty and, you know, not vote for D- Donald Trump when they had pledged to do so and, and on and on. So it, you, one realizes that by our democracy, what they mean is their oligarchy, and it's their oligarchy that they are dead set on, uh, on, on protecting. So at the end of the day, Democrats seem, at least this species of Democrats, seems to believe that democracy means rule by Democrats, which is not uh, the definition of democracy, I think, that most of us would, would wish to subscribe to. I mean, there are two things that jump to mind listening to you. One is, you know, right after Trump was elected, and this has continued continued throughout his term and, and to this day, the idea that you can't normalize Trump. And I'm thinking to myself, 
what does this actually mean? If someone has been democratically elected, you somehow still treat them as if they weren't? You still treat them as if they have somehow forfeited the claim to that the people themselves have entrusted to them? And, and the, second, the second thing about it is this notion of, well, you know what? It's our democracy itself that's on the ballot in 2024. Yes. And I'm yes. thinking to myself, wait a minute, is it, you know, ballots are cast within a democracy. You know, democracy yes. itself is never yes. on the ballot. And in fact... Yes. When democracies are established in, in the beginning, they're always established by force. I mean, yes. when the American yes. Revolution yes. brought democracy, right. didn't put democracy on the ballot and outvote right. the British, the <laughs> British were <laughs> overthrown and then yes. democracy right. is established. Yes. So there's right. a certain sleight of hand. Uh, but now you're introducing a little bit of historical reality, Dash. That's not acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what you're saying, I, and this comes, this really brings me to your article here because I, I love the title. It's Kamala Harris and the Mask, M-A-S-Q-U-E, the Mask of right. Magical Thinking. So let's begin by introducing what a mask is and then talk a little bit about what you mean by the mask of magical thinking. Yeah. Okay. So a mask was a um, an entertainment. It was popular uh, in the 16th, 17th, I think early 18th century. It involved dancing and costumes and singing and uh, elaborate stage sets. Uh, and they were courtly entertainments. And they were meant to flatter the patron of this entertainment. So I thought, uh, 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 say, and what is magical thinking? Magical thinking is basically the belief that your thoughts constitute reality uh, all everybody who's been to graduate school has been battened on this idea that somehow the empirical reality doesn't really exist objective reality doesn't really exist we can create it with our own thoughts especially if they're super virtuous thoughts which of course we as vir super virtuous people who are entitled to rule we all of our thoughts are virtuous and it occurred to me that uh, that's exactly what's going on here uh, with Kamala Harris. You have a situation uh, in which perhaps the most unpopular politician on the American scene until two weeks ago uh, is, is suddenly inexplicably uh, dusted off and inflated uh, like with, with an air pump to become the best thing since sliced bread. So we have the cover of New York Magazine this week with the picture of Kamala cackling, sitting on top of the world with Barack Obama and Chuck Schumer and even Joe Biden, God help us, uh, dancing underneath. Now the idea, that, and it's called Camelot, K-A-M-A-L-O-T, of course. And so who knew that they say, you know, that the Democrats found out that they're their destiny was the White House after all, or words to that effect. Now, this is very peculiar. Uh, two weeks ago, Kamala was perhaps the most unpopular per politician going. Remember in the 2020 election, she won no delegates, none, zero. We had a primary, 14 point something million people voted for Joe Biden. That, when the Democrats understood, was not going to fly. They somehow, in a very undemocratic process, pushed him out, pushed him out, and inserted Kamala. Uh, if, if you're going to talk to me about the importance of democracy, I'd like to have you explain to me about what just happened. Now, uh, people are absolutely giddy. They're intoxicated. They're inebriated with the thought of Kamala taking over. But this is, in my opinion, is not going to happen. This little, I, I called it a kind of sugar high. It's a very temporary feeling of exaltation that is already beginning to disintegrate. <clears throat> and uh, I, I predict that by Labor Day, we will see that bubble uh, has been popped. And within a few weeks after that, uh, it will be definitively gone. And of course, if, if the stock market continues its current uh, astringent movement, uh, um, Donald Trump will probably win all of the states. But uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's, a very, it's a very peculiar phenomenon. And uh, it's, it's also, I think I said this in the article, a very predictable thing. You see this often with utopian thinking, and, and the Democrats are nothing if not utopian 
in their approach to reality, that uh, they think that because they are virtuous people, um, what they believe trumps anything, no pun intended there, trumps anything that is merely a matter of process or uh, democratic rules. And they're perfectly willing to subvert all of that in order to get their agenda through. So what has just been happening to Donald Trump over these last many months, when uh, he was essentially the victim of a bill of attainder, uh, something forbidden by the Constitution, but he was singled out for special treatment. Uh, what about the Eighth Amendment that, that forbids uh, not only cruel and unusual punish punishment, but also excessive fines? How is it possible that a judge in New York fined him $350 million for, it is alleged, overvaluing his real estate assets? But that's what they did. The bank that uh, lent Trump the money was happy to do business with him. He paid back the money uh, on time and with interest. They would be happy to do business with him, with him again. So there were there were no victims of this alleged fraud, and yet um, they impose uh, a historically unprecedented fine upon him. The same thing with all these other cases. The the you know um, somebody made a a, a a bookkeeping error, or perhaps it was deliberate in the Trump organization for Trump to pay his then lawyer. How can you uh, take what is at most a misdemeanor? At most. Uh, a, a misdemeanor and elevate it into a 34 count felony that could put Trump away in jail for the rest of his life. And yet they did this, you know, and then we, you know, we have Jack Smith and so on. It's, it's an inc incredible what they have done to this guy. And yet like some uh, science fiction character, the more uh, they attack him, the stronger he seems to grow. I mean, I, I, I don't watch, you know, all of any of these, rallies, but I try to tune in on them sometimes. And what, what strikes me is the incredible enthusiasm that Trump is able to generate, not in thousands of people, but tens of thousands of people, day in and day out across the country. He just went to, you know, supposedly deep blue Georgia in Atlanta and had, you know, I don't know how many people he had there, but a lot. And they were incredibly uh, enthusiastic. So, I mean, he, whatever else you can say about Trump, he is a natural politician. He just oozes charisma. And uh, that's one of the reasons that they hate him. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that he's going to win the next election, I think. Let's be, uh, let's take a pause. We come back a final segment with Roger Kimball. I'm back with Roger Kimball, editor of The New Criterion, newcriterion.com. Follow him on X at Roger Kimball. Uh, Roger, you're talking about magical thinking and uh, you were talking about the Trump cases. And, uh, you know, I think it's isn't it so true that before the Colorado case, which was an attempt to throw him off the ballot, I remember CNN had a panel of legal experts. Right. They might have had yeah. Judge Michael Luttig. There were all these luminaries on there and all yeah. of them were serenely confident that right. the plain language of the Constitution imposed right. upon the Supreme Court an absolute duty to give a 9-0 yeah. decision <laughs> that right. would right. throw Trump off the ballot, giving other right. states like Maine and others the option of doing the same. And, right. and all of them in saw... In the name of democracy, of course. In the name right. of democracy. <laughs> and they yeah. saw... No, they didn't even worry about it. May, might this open right. a Pandora's box? Might Republican right. states throw by? None of this even came up. It was yeah. just as if right. this is a done deal. And then the Supreme Court goes 9-0 the other way. Yeah. And I, you, well, now we've got to do something about the Supreme Court, right? Right. Now we've got to fix <laughs> the court. No, exactly. Exactly. Let's come back to Kamala Harris because there's a very yeah. encouraging, you know, you, you actually quote our buddy Jim uh, Pearson, longtime yes director of the Olin Foundation. Yes. And, and Jim says Trump will win the election by six points, 49 to 43, winning 339 electoral votes, including some of the swing states, but also Democratic leaning states like Virginia, Minnesota, New Hampshire. Now, obviously, this would be fantastic because as Jim goes yeah. on to say, this will probably lead to majorities in the House and in the yes. Senate. Yes. Um, yes. The, uh, I mean, this would be, uh, if, if, if 2016 was delightful, uh, this will be something for us to rejoice over yes. because yes. the left will be, I don't even know what to say. They will, yes. they will be uh, beside themselves and more. Yes, um, well, I remember uh, my friend Taki Theodorakopoulos when the 
when the Berlin Wall fell, he uh, took over the Savoy Hotel and had a party for, you know, 300 of his closest friends. We should do something like that on January 6th. But <laughs> <laughs> that's that's absolutely a great idea. Uh, no, wonderful. So you think that you think that Kamala, I mean, we all are, <coughs> and I think rightly so. We recognize that the left does have a a real stranglehold over so many institutions. I mean, not just academia, not just the yes. media, not just Hollywood, but now we realize the intelligence agencies of the government yes. to a degree, the military. So yes. even institutions that we thought of as being right-leaning or conservative are in their grasp or somewhat in their grasp. So they're going to make an all-out effort to say that Kamala is not the silly cackling idiot that you have, may have seen her to be that those are i mean think of it they did the same with biden right they were right. claiming till right. the very end that biden was in fact a hidden genius that in yes. in closed door pack, seminars right, right exactly yeah, his yeah. sparkling <laughs> intelligence shone through it's only when that became untenable that right. they were like uh oops okay we got to right. move this guy right. out right. but you think the kamala thing is likely to implode in somewhat the same way I do, I do, but I at, at the same time I, I take your point. Uh, it's not a done deal until it's done, and you're quite right. Uh, large swaths of the intelligence and surveillance uh, agencies, uh, parts of the military, uh, certainly the media, almost one hundred percent, and academia, one hundred and ten percent. All of these major, major institutions, um, the Google, the whole tech, the, the tech world, they are all in, uh, not for Kamala so much, but they're all in for the narrative, the narrative that has been uh, put forward by this woke ideology. Um, you know, Elon Musk, I think it was he who coined the phrase mind virus, that that, uh, that, that the woke ideology is a mind virus. I think that's, that's quite right. It's communicable and it's deadly. It's a very toxic uh, cognitive, um, uh, you know, uh, attack. And I think that people who care about the future of the country, who care about our prosperity, our security, who care about the... Um, uh, you know, reinvigorating essential institutions uh, like uh, uh, the military, like our intelligence services and so on, uh, really have to push back as hard and as concertedly as possible against the real source of this problem, which is this woke ideology. And it's a multi, it's like the hydra, hydra you know, it has to be, um, uh, it has to be uh, uh, each head has to be cut off and cauterized. It's a very it's going to be a very hard thing to do because they have insinuated themselves right into the interstices of all of the basic institutions that run the country. That's why I have um, often argued that uh, since the locus of this beast, the locus of this Leviathan is Washington, D.C., Washington is really the enemy. I, I, I urge Donald Trump, if, uh, when he's reelected, to move as much of the government outside of Washington as possible, because it, it is, I, in my view, irrecoverable. Um, he, he made some gestures in that direction in his first term. Uh, his uh, Secretary of the Interior, David Bernhardt, uh, moved much of the, inter sec of the Interior Department to the Interior. That's a good idea out of the swamp. Um, I think we should move the Department of uh, Justice to Kansas or Antarctica. Uh, we should move, well, the, the IRS should be disbanded, of course, as should the Department of Education. But the, 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 the state, uh, the government, is way too big. It's way too concentrated in this one place. Remember, Thomas Jefferson wanted to move uh, the capital from New York to its present location partly to make it closer to Virginia, but partly to put it on neutral ground, to, uh, to a, a place that was neither uh, Republican nor Democrat nor Whig nor Federalist, but neutral ground. Well, it has long since ceased to be that. 
It is a wholly owned subsidiary of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And uh, its, its business is to propagate an agenda of dependency. And that is what they do. And the, in my view, the only way to get rid of that is to um, sharply reduce their power and prestige. And I hope that that is on the agenda for the next Trump administration. I mean, it seems to me as we close out uh, for today, Roger, that this part of this requires showing Republicans that being junior members of the swamp is yes. not the way to go. In other words, um, you know, in other words, they Absolutely. feel like if this is the only watering hole, we realize that the big dinosaur is the Democrats are there, but maybe we'll get right. a little spot to drink yes. right over there too. That, that, that really that's it's exactly how they act. Exactly how they act. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this has been this is good stuff, Roger. And um, I'm gonna have to have you back. This is fascinating and there's a lot more uh, where this came from. Guys, I've been talking to Roger Kimball, editor of the New Criterion. Uh, follow him on X at Roger Kimball, newcriterion.com. Roger, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks, Dinesh. Talk soon. Bye. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.